Okay, the course is the uh, principles of Bible study. And as you can see, the prerequisite is none. The instructor, all the information you need about me if you are not able to be here. You want to send me an email or call me, and the teaching assistant is Sammy with all her information. And the course website is listed there. Uh, the course examines various methods of Bible study. Actually, we are going to be studying uh, 12 different methods of Bible study uh, that are part of biblical interpretation and research. Uh, that's the, those are the objectives of the course. I'm not going to go through that. And on page 2, I want to draw your attention to uh, certain things here. Course readings. I'm using two textbooks. One is uh, by Rick Warren, the, the pastor who wrote that Purpose Driven Church, a Purpose Driven Church, yeah. Purpose Driven Life. And the book is called Bible Study Methods 12 Ways You Can Unlock God's Words. I'm also using John MacArthur's book called How to Study the Bible. Now, you are not required to buy these textbooks, okay? I'm going to summarize it, but if you want to buy them, you can go ahead, but if you're not required to, uh, I will uh, summarize what we need to know about those textbooks. Assessments, exams, and grading. There is no test in this course. There's no test, there is no exam in this course, okay? This is a... This is a skilled course, so there will be no test. There will be no test. If you are listening to this uh, the audio, we have a young man here who has uh, his computer going, uh, a special student with us tonight. So just ignore him. This is not uh, in Africa where they are chicken or crowing. Uh, this is uh, in the United States. Okay. Now, I want to emphasize, there is no exam for the course, there is no test, there is no quiz, okay? Now everybody is excited, right? You are taking a class where you have no, no exam, no quiz, no uh, test, okay? Now, that doesn't mean there will be no assessment, okay? How am I going to grade you? Your grading will be based uh, we are on the principles of Bible study. We are on page uh, page two. Okay, the way this works is I'm going to pair you up. Okay, do we get? We're going to have to, uh, teams. We have teams, and two students will get together, and they will uh, apply one of the Bible study methods we are going to study. Or if you want to do it on your own, you can do it by yourself. But you're going to demonstrate in class how to apply the Bible study method that we are going to study. Okay? So on the second day of the class, I'm going to organize the teams. I will take your names and put it in a basket and you draw out your name. So, you know, two students. If you are such an independent person, you want to do it on your own, you are welcome to do that. Okay? So there will be, so then everybody will be, every team is being, will be graded by the class. So you come up here and you go through one of the Bible study methods and the whole class will grade you. So the grade for that team will be determined by the members of the class. And that will constitute your final grade. So your grade is dependent on how well you can demonstrate any of the Bible study methods that we're going to use. Is that clear? So that would be the only exam in the class. So the first part of the of the course would be the lectures, and then the second part would be where students now come and you demonstrate that you will see that. Up there. Any question on that? Okay. We would. Right. Okay. I'm coming to that. Okay. So. You will see then uh, the course schedule. We start with introduction tonight. And then the, we will go through now the 12 
Bible study methods that are summarized. For instance, we are starting, these are the detailed description. The number one, well actually I have two there, but one is, is called the devotional method of Bible study. So for example, a student could select uh, which of them to do. Then we have the chapter summary method of Bible study. Then the character quality method of Bible study. The thematic method of Bible study. The biographic method of Bible study. The topical method of Bible study. The word study method of Bible study. The book background study of Bible study. The book survey method of Bible study. The chapter analysis method of Bible study. The book synthesis method of Bible study. And the verse by verse method of Bible study. So these are the 12 methods of Bible study that we are going to learn during the course of this semester. And what I've done here is I have selected which of those ones that I want you, but if any of you or any team wants to do a compelling one that I did not select because I selected only six for the team presentation. And I've not selected the team members yet. So you are welcome. Uh, I wanted to do it at random so that everybody, you know, you don't know who you are going to be a team member. But if somebody says, you know, let me study, let me do my own presentation by myself, you are welcome to do that. Okay? But I want two people to do it together. Right? So for instance, team one will have the devotional method. Team two will have the topical method. Mm -hmm. Team three, we have the chapter method. And we still have this student with us. Team four, we have the thematics method. Team five, book survey method. And themes, I mean, team six, verse by verse method of Bible study. Okay, is that clear? So these are the Bible study method. I just took them at random, okay? So we will be doing lectures, and then we will ask each of the teams now to come up here, do your homework, and then present how that method is used. Okay? That's all the exam you're gonna do. Because this is a skill course. It is to demonstrate how you can do that. This is not a knowledge-based course. It is intended to give you the skills for you to know how to interpret the scriptures for yourself and to use it in teaching and in preaching. Okay? Question. Yes. For and so we have all the teams here, one, two, three, and one person, okay, so, the, so one person decides to go on their own. So then you won't have one person left over. So that forces that person to go on their own too. Well, or, do they, or do they join another team to make it three each? No, I want to, I want to, no, I don't want more than two. That could create a potential problem, but I don't want more than two people to be in a team. Because during the presentation, I'm hoping that the, uh, that the two members will actually show their proficiency with this thing. So yeah, that could create a problem, but you know, that's the that's problem with that. Alternatively, I think we have, as, I think we got about 12 people signed up for this class so far. So that's why I'm having six, six teams. Yeah, but if I have a choice to go on my own, then somebody else will go on. Yeah, that's, that could be a problem, but. <laughs> but there may be somebody who really wants to dig into this and they really wanted to do it, and then I want to give that person the opportunity to do so. So, all right. Any other questions on the syllabus? So you understand? So on um, the uh, class, the only on the, uh, the teams you have selected already, in as much as we go generally over the course test. Twelve methods. Methods. So yeah. Will you be focused on the six methods that we're going to be? No, 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 no. We are studying all twelve all methods. 12 methods. And I'm proposing, I'm proposing these six methods. But some a team I like another method and said, you know, can I do another one? This is this was a sample I was suggesting. Um, but I mean, people can be free to do that. There is any special preference for proposing the six? 
No, no. no. I selected these. Yes. I wanted to do somewhat what I considered to very compelling. But a team can propose which one they want to do. Now, my 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 goal is that everybody knows how all 12 methods work. So please don't select your own and then disregard the rest. I'm hoping that you have the ability to apply all 12 methods. But I can't have a new presentation on all 12. Okay. So I want you to select one and demonstrate mastery of that method. But I want you to know all, method, all the methods. But your presentation is going to be based on only one of those methods. Again, this is a skill course. It is to demonstrate that you have the right skill to interpret the scripture using one of these methods. So are we going to like, um, are we going to demonstrate it in class or also going to do like, let's say a Bible study? You can do that. This one is intended for class. Once you are comfortable with it, you can do Bible study. You might even start looking for preaching engagement to demonstrate your, your, your ability. <laughs> so, so. That's why I want to go. That's why I want to go slow, because what we have been doing throughout the school is giving you the knowledge. But some people can know the knowledge and they don't know how to preach or they don't know how to teach. Yeah, that's true. That's why I'm hoping this skill course now will give you the ability to know how to. Hopefully, from Pastor Tabla's class, you know how to preach, mm -hmm. but you may not necessarily know how to interpret the Bible. Okay. So the goal of this course is really to impart skills of biblical interpretation. And I've chosen a relatively simple book that can allow you to do that. This is not hermeneutics. This is not the principles of uh, interpretation, even though the description says so. This is, these are just principles. I took a very simple book uh, to, to do this, okay? Is that clear? All right. With that then, the course schedule, as we said here on page three, on page two, is introduction. So tonight we are starting with introduction to these, to these principles. Take one and pass it along. So uh, next week, we should be, by next week, you should be able to um, find a team member. No, I'm going to do it at random. I'm going to take your name and put it in a basket and shake it. Okay, I don't want you to start shopping around and trying to convince somebody to be on your team. Okay. And, and, and the teams, you are going to demonstrate that everybody, each one of you put an equal amount of work. I don't want one person doing it and then the rest, uh, the other team member just come and do the presentation. No, we don't want that, please. All right. The, uh, this is lecture number one. And we are on the thing there. Again, the two textbooks that we are using are uh, Rick Warren's book, Rick Warren's Bible Study Methods, 12 Ways You Can Unlock God's Word, uh, published by Zonovan, and John McCarter's book, How to Study the Bible. Now, I don't like John McCarter's book, so I'm just taking a few items from McCarter's book, uh, as you will see tonight. Most of the lectures are taken from Rick Warren's book, okay? But I think John Makata has something very good to say about the Bible, the attributes of the Bible. So I'm taking his book just to illustrate some of the presuppositions. By the way, what do we mean when we say presuppositions? From your study already from this school. When we say this person has a presupposition about the scripture, what are we saying? That is, they have a prior belief. Something they believe before they approach. There are some people who say the Bible is just another book right the bible is this so they already have a presupposition now these presuppositions that i'm talking about tonight are generally what we call evangelicals we have are you with me presuppositions now i intentionally put them here but i want to warn you that outside of churches like bethel CCC, um, Ebenezer, 
Christ for the nations, assemblies of God, there are not many people who have these presuppositions. We're going to go over them as you see that. And I'm calling them, uh, Makata calls them eh, attributes of the Bible. And I say, according to Makata, there are several things, I call them presuppositions, that a person who wants to study the Bible needs to realize. Okay? So before we can even go into the Bible study methods, according to Makata, this is some background you already need to have before you approach the Bible. Again, as a conservative evangelical believer, for instance, we believe, number one, that the Bible is infallible. Right? Are you with me? Evangelicals eh, believe that the Bible is infallible. That is, the Bible in its entirety has no mistakes. So when people are telling you the Bible is infallible, what they are saying is the Bible has no mistakes. Now, let me warn you now, you are in theological school. There are many people who don't believe that. But we evangelicals believe that the Bible has no mistakes. Let me give you an instance. I believe in, the, uh, in Genesis. Moses said that the children of Israel were in Egypt 400 years. Right? That's what we know. In the book of Acts, when Stephen was uh, arrested and about to be stoned, stoned, I think in his speech, in the sermon to the group, Stephen said that the children of Israel were in Egypt 430 years. Okay? Now, was that a mistake? So somebody can point out to you that the Bible has mistakes. Now, we evangelicals might have a way to explain that. But now, what do we mean, what do evangelicals mean that the Bible is without mistake? Okay, yes, yes, Makada's position, and this is an evangelical position, because specifically what we evangelicals are saying when we say the Bible is without mistake, we are saying the original autographs that were written by the scholars who wrote the Bible has no mistake. So what we are saying is the copies we have today, it is possible they have mistakes. Okay? Because they are copied. Okay? But the one that Luke wrote, the one that Paul wrote, the one that Isaiah wrote, were without mistakes. So when evangelicals are saying, if somebody can point out error today in the Bible, can say, oh yeah, yeah, we know that. But the one they wrote before, it had no error. So evangelicals will say, in the original autographs, the Bible is without error. It's infallible. Now, you can take it and uh, develop your own apologetics about it. Try to defend it. Eh, mentally. You go to Liberia, you start preaching, and somebody come to you and say, oh man, the Bible has errors. Okay? Then you, you try to escape, go down and say, I know that. But I'm saying the original manuscripts had no errors in them. Eh? Estella, mm -hmm. you should just speak Creole, Creole and tell somebody that. <laughs> okay. That's what we that even yell because mean by that. And my card I quoted here, the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm uh, 19.7. The Bible is flawless because, now, this is a typical evangelical position. Why is the Bible without error? Because God wrote it. The Holy Spirit moved the people. So if God is flawless, if God is perfect, then whatever he does is flawless. Okay? So it's the translator that makes the error. They, that's what they would say. Because the scribes who were looking at it through lantern, copying the scribes who were doing that, it is possible they could make a mistake. But I'm saying, when Isaiah wrote, nothing. When David wrote, he, he was moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, we get into historical theology. All right. But Makata says, this is a presupposition you have to have before you even approach Bible study method. Before we come to the methods, we have to have our uh, bibliolo bibliology correct. Our attitude about the Bible, we got to get it correct. Number two, the Bible 
is inherent, we say. So, Makara will say all the parts of the Bible are without error. So, like, like I pointed out, now those of you who studied when we studied the general epistles, we said Second Peter has a lot of errors in it. Of course, Makara and the evangelical scholars will say, oh yeah, we know that. But the original one had no errors. Okay? So, the word of God is pure. Proverbs 35, 6. So every word of God is pure and true. Presupposition number two. Number three. The Bible is complete. Now, I happen to believe this one. That is to say, you don't have to add anything to the Bible. Okay? If somebody comes to you and says, I receive a new revelation that we have to add to the scripture, you say, mm -mm. I receive a prophecy from God. And they say, no, 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 the Bible is already complete. Presupposition number four, the Bible is authoritative. The Bible is final authority. Okay, we don't, add, we don't need another book, another insight to add to the Bible. It's already. Yea, O heavens, and give you O earth, for the Lord has spoken. When God speaks, everyone must listen and obey. All right? That makes sense? All right. So these are attribute number five. The Bible is sufficient. All right. Okay. The Bible is sufficient. Now, this again, this is one presupposition I happen to believe. The Bible is enough for salvation. If somebody wants to, that's, now, as an evangelical theologian, this is one position I, now, whether the Bible is inherent, whether the Bible is, what else we say, without, is inherent or infallible, this presupposition I believe as an evangelical scholar. I could even acknowledge that even the original manuscripts could have errors. It is possible. But what I do know is, the Bible is sufficient for what it is intended to do. Are you here? It is enough for salvation. So what was the purpose of the Bible? It's not supposed to talk about science because some people might argue. Is it true that Joshua told the sun to stand still? Some people might say it is scientifically impossible. But I might have, we are arguing with science. I can say for salvation, if somebody needs to be saved, the Bible is sufficient for that purpose. Number two, the Bible is sufficient to make us perfect. Perfect in the sense of being a mature Christian. The Bible is sufficient in the hope that it is intended to establish about heaven. The Bible is sufficient in its blessing. So everything we need to be blessed is in the Bible. Presupposition number six. The Bible is, we do what it promises, so it's effective. Okay? Does it tell you how to dress? Doc, are you doing sir? No, no, you want me to say how to do scholars. That's right, that's right, the scholars. Right, <laughs> Good. The Bible is effective and in, 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 in the sense that what it is supposed to do, it will do it well. When we say something is effective for the purpose for which it was designed, it is adequate for it. And Makara said the Bible is determinative. Uh, how a person responds to oh, okay. This is another important presupposition about the Bible. Makara is saying the attitude you bring to the Bible will determine its effectiveness in your life. If you don't want to read it as literature, it will not do so much. If you bring spiritual desire and attitude to it, the Bible will do it the work that it was intended to do. Okay? Any question about these presuppositions? Okay? This is lecture part. Okay? So this is my kindest attitude. So before we can even approach the Bible, my Carter is saying these are the prior things that we have to believe. Are you put here? Yes, sir. This is the so now as evangelical scholars, as conservative Christians. This is what we believe. So somebody might say the Bible is another literature. You will say, mm, that's not my presupposition. That's not my belief about the Bible. Now, that's what I'm teaching in this class. 
you don't have to believe it because we are in theological school. But I'm teaching this class, all my courses from an entirely evangelical position, from a, um, and as you will see, okay? Does that mean I'm afraid to engage other people who have different presuppositions about the Bible? No, I'm not. Any question? Is this clear? It's clear enough. All right. Then, so with that background, with that presuppositions, then we want to say, what are the tools that I need to now do the Bible study methods that we want to engage in in this semester? What do I need to have? What are the tools that you need to have? Well, number one, you need a study Bible. Okay? You need a Bible. Now, let me point out to you this. Study Bibles are a two-edged sword. They can be good and they can be bad. Okay? Because most of you, you know, some of the Bible, in the bottom of the, uh, of the Bible, the, the people explain it, it can be a weakness. Because you can be dependent on it. And you don't do your own work. Okay? It can help you. But it is not the gospel. Okay? But some people depend on it so much. Okay? So we are saying, grab yourself a study Bible. Okay? Grab a, grab a study Bible. Which one? Which one do you Well, just a minute now. So I want you to do that. Okay, I got the versions there, Natalie. Okay? What are you on? What are you? New International Version. No. I want to download an NIV Bible. No, why are you on there? Yeah, no, 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 on your computer. Why are you set looking at? Oh, I'm trying to download a NFB Bible. All right, close your, close your thing there because I want you to pay attention to it. All right, okay. All right, you take your notes because, okay, all right, all right. I'm on page two, Brenda. Okay, on the lecture number one. Okay. You are still looking at your computer. No, Pastor, it's not even on. Oh, okay, all right, good, okay. You take your pen because I want you to be taking notes. Okay. 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 All right. Am I old, old, old traditional man? Okay. That's okay. That's All right. Okay. Old school. All right. So we are saying tools for Bible study. Number one, what did I say? You need a study Bible. Okay. Now these are different versions of the Bible. As, as Bible scholars, you should have enough versions of the Bible. Some of them they can have, uh, but we'll go through that. One is a new international version. Now, I want to point out to you, uh, there are many, we'll come to that, but there are, the NIV, the new international version, is a very popular version of the Bible. Okay, some of you know in this church, in our church, uh, maybe in all nations too, this is a very popular but it is not the standard, okay? In some sense, uh, you can say that it is a little bit of interpretation than translation, okay? It is more, and it, and it, and it's, it's an interpret, in, like I, the example I always give, Betty, the group will say, okay, okay, I will send you, to this place, okay? If you put it in English, it is impossible to do that, okay? You see what I'm saying? Na mu ne ta na okay? In translation, ordinarily is, you are trying to convey the meaning of what the person says, not word by word, translation of every word. If you do that, the sentence has no meaning. Okay? Uh, are you forgetting me? Okay. If I say in crew, gila, it's easy to interpret, come here. So every word in that sentence, you are translating it. But if I say, give by daddy, come let us eat, you're not interpreting every word. G <coughs> By dead D. Come, let us eat. It's not like that. Okay. The NIV is giving you the the sense <coughs> of what the person is saying. Okay. It's not necessarily a word by word <coughs> translation. Okay. But it's a good one. Now, 
the number B, the New American Standard Bible, it is the most recognized as the accurate translation that is faithful to the original language. So if you want a Bible that is really, <coughs> that translates from the Greek, from the Hebrew, the New American International Standard is the best. Okay? Most people prefer the NIV because there are many con concordances that are tuned to the NIV. Okay? Now, number C, the Amplified Version. I love that. Now, it can be very boring because it is doing everything uh, for you to get the sense of it. I mean, have you, anybody seen the Amplified Version? I mean, it, it's doing everything for you to get the meaning. So we put in parentheses different meanings of that one word. But very good. Okay. Uh, and then the new one that just came, the New Living Translation, which I use sometimes in church. But it is... It, it, it's watered down if you want to look at it, but it gives you the very good meaning. Okay, I personally prefer, especially Sunday morning when I'm preaching. I like everybody in the church to have it, but if you don't have it, I like to put it overhead. But uh, Brenda and uh, Nad, they use, I think they use the NIV. I would prefer that we use a New Living Translation of the Bible overhead, but everybody can have their Bible at home. But when I come to church and I'm preaching, I like the New Living Translation because it's very simple. You know, you can get it. Then they have today's new international version. I have not read that. Okay. This, this, uh, Rick says here that it's closer to the NIV, only 7% difference. So, what we are saying is you have to invest in a good, steady Bible. You may not necessarily bring it to church, but at home, if you want to do serious uh, Bible study, it is important that you have a steady Bible for yourself that you keep somewhere. Yes. Would you recommend hard copy or app? I don't care. I don't care. I think these days most people, uh, you mean on your computer, on your phone. Yeah. yeah. I think it's even better these days because some people are embarrassed to carry their Bible around and they play or something. Have it. Yeah. You can just upload it. I just like it because I can switch back and forth. Exactly. exactly. I mean, look, these days nobody has an excuse because all the Bibles, I mean, my, uh, my, my, uh, my iPad, I mean, I can't believe that it got almost, I mean, different versions of that thing there. I'm saying, whoa. Okay. Now, the only thing about it, I still haven't learned how to underline because in my Bibles, uh, you know, Margaret doesn't like that, but I write through my Bible. Yeah, you can't but you can't take notes. I don't know what you I get a place on note that's all dependent on the Bible. They get a place and they get a place like highlight and all stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, somebody needs to show me that because my Bibles I write a lot. Now the funny thing about some of my writing is then when I come back to the scripture, I see something different. <laughs> you know, because I was doing a study once time on uh, Mark eleven twenty two. I mean I wrote so much. But years after that, when I went back, I mean, I saw a different thing, and I already wrote <laughs> over okay. but, but that's what can happen. Okay? So, what we are saying here, Stella, is that you need to, is that the Bible you're looking at, or you're texting somebody? It's the Bible. Yeah? It's the Bible. Oh, okay. You're not texting your, your boyfriend or something like that. <laughs> right. I'm just making sure I can get a little to sing Which you version is that? Oh, no, this is NIV. NIV, okay. All right. But you get that now. So now these days, eh, you can use your study Bible, you can use whatever. What I'm saying is, as a Bible student, somebody who has come to this class, you ought to have a very good study Bible. Okay? The one you are comfortable with. Now, you will see the relevance of what I'm saying when we come to how you're going to use these tools in applying these principles. All right. Any question on the Bible? Okay. Uh, all right. Then we come to our page three, we come to concordances. Okay, now, I'm gonna warn you, but, uh, I'm, uh, but we'll, for those of you who are st starting out, for me, I do, okay, I'll make a comment, I'll make a commentary later on. There are some of, some people, let me give a warning here. There are some people who like to read all kinds of books that people write about the Bible. It's good and bad. 
Okay? You remember I told you about presuppositions about the Bible? A lot of people have presuppositions about the Bible and it is evident in what they write. Okay? So if you don't know the person's presupposition, where they are coming from, and you invest in their books, it can influence your theology. Okay? That's why I'm emphasizing that you develop the tool for yourself to study the Bible. And not just copy somebody's writing or what they say about the Bible. That's why I'm saying somebody study Bibles where people make uh, write all kinds of things. You can't take it as gospel. It's not part of it's not uh, inspired. Okay? Invest in your own. And these days, especially you go on the internet and you want to do you want to prepare a sermon on, on faith. And young people put it there. And they think they got it. Mm. But what if you like I got a Bible? If you put in the like the Psalm 100 and we put all the related scripture, all the okay, now we're coming to that. Okay, you see that's why we are coming. That's one of the pr principle of Bible study. That's not what I'm saying. Concordances. Let's look at it now, page three. By far the most important, according to Regner, tool next to the Bible, and concordance provide an index of every word contain each verse. That's why the concordance you can see. In, in the office, by the way, we, we are in uh, Brenda and Sammy and myself. We have the this school has a resource room downstairs. We already have some, uh, but we are going to invest a lot of Bible study tools and books. So we want to have we have concordances there already. We have Bible, we want to have Bible dictionaries down there. So somebody can just come on Saturday or somebody when somebody is here, you go down there and you do your own research. Especially when you are invited to preach somewhere, you have enough time and you want to invest in that. But what the concordance does is that every word in the Bible, it will list that and where it is used and what the different meaning is. Because my people, you know, when I say, oh, I love this recorder, right? I use the word love, right? Oh, I love my shirt. Oh, I love my wife. I'm using the same word. The same way with the scriptures. So you have to look at the context in which it is used. So that's why a concordance is very helpful. You cannot assume that the word has the same meaning in every verse. Okay? So the concordance will list each of the usage of the word as the, uh, the uh, passage illustrates that okay it will list all of that uh, an exhaustive concordance provide now some of the bibles they have very small concordance in the back of it some of you have your bibles right so for instance you want to preach today on prayer like you were saying Matali, all throughout the bible prayer will show up so like you're saying you put in the word and bam everywhere where that word is used is shown no, what I say, let's say we're doing John 3.16. Okay. If you do John 3.16, uh, my Bible will bring up all the scripture that links to it. Right, that's what I'm saying. It, okay. it, it, you mean it will take each word or the passage? It will give you the cross, the cross reference of that scripture. You see, like, I pulled John 14.11. Okay. These are all the related scripture concerning that identical passage. So let's say you talk about John 14, you say, um, you can also open to Matthew 11, 4. They're talking about the same thing, but in different scriptures. So it said that. Okay, but that's what I'm saying. You see, that's, it's good and bad. Because what inside, okay. You see, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's good for a lazy person. Madeline, listen. <coughs> because if, if, if it were taking one word, then it will make sense. But the whole passage, well, I don't know, I, I can't comment on it, okay? You could use that, I, I presume, okay? So, number three, so we talk about a steady Bible, we talk about concordances, uh, and these are different concordances, by the way. There's one called Strong's NIV Exhaustive, uh, exhaustive Concordance. The strong uh, New International Standard Bible uh, uh, Exhaustive Concordance. 
can do this. Now I have I have noticed that these days, again, I pre now even with the internet and the Google and all that thing, okay, I happen to have most of the New Testament, I have a study of each of them, exhaustive study. I simply saw last semester when we were studying the book of Revelation. The Revelation, I have about two different technical books on, on Revelation, that are chapter by chapter, okay? Most of the New Testament, I got single books on each of them, on each of the books of the New Testament. I've not done so much. So I consider myself a New Testament specialist, okay? I'm not, not yet, except maybe for the Psalms and the Proverbs, and maybe I say a little bit. But I've not developed strong expertise in the Old Testament as I have done on the New Testament. So what I'm saying is, you can use concordance, which is very broad, but some of us have invested in each of the books of the scripture where they have detailed study on each of the books, okay? I happen to use a man called uh, Barclay, but Barclay is not a different. He doesn't have the same presupposition, so I always warn people who don't have strong theological background to stay away from Barclay. Let me be the one to, you know, to chew on Barclay, because I know where he's coming from. Because when you get into miracles, for instance, Barclay takes a different position. And I don't want to expose people, for instance, when Jesus walked on the water, he said, no, he didn't walk on the water. He just walk around the lake. And, 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 oh, Lord. Okay, so, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, but Barclay, please, Pastor, for what our congregation is closing. Okay. But, uh, so, we said study Bible. We said concordance. Number three, a Bible dictionary or a Bible encyclopedia. It's a very good tool to use. What it does is it will help you to define a word, okay? Now, as we will see, what am I trying to teach you here? I don't want anybody coming from our school and going up there to preach and say, I was having my devotion at last night and this is what the Lord said to me. Mm -mm. If you have a devotion, what the Lord said to you, okay? When you get up there to preach, I don't want what the Lord should reveal to you. I want you to define the word and the passage, and then you can leave me to apply it to myself. Now, we will study the devotional method. That's the first method we will study. But as you will see, I've always been saying in this class, I don't want you to tell me this is what I, I think. This is, the Lord said to me, okay, okay, keep it for yourself first. So the dictionary helps you to define the term in the passage. What is the importance of that? So you will understand. And one of the things, and the devotional method I was preparing is, it is to imagine what the writer had in mind when they wrote that passage. Right? Now what do you think? All right. So a Bible dictionary, a Bible dictionary uh, number three, explains many of the words, topics, customs, and traditions in the Bible. A uh, Bible encyclopedia is an expanded dictionary. Some dictionaries, so these are certain ones I put here. Uh, each of them, I always give you a sample. So these are, I give you the, uh, the concordances. These are some Bible dictionaries. Now. I presume these days most people will not uh, use a Bible dictionary because they can Google. Now, please, now, Estella, you can start with the, with the, um, eh? helmet. You can start with the, some people can go in the dictionary, you know, Webster or something like that. Okay? Okay? I said here what, what type of dictionary? What, did, what dictionary I said? The Bible, the well, I said Bible dictionary. So that you start preaching on trust or uh, grace. And the first thing you do, you go to the regular dictionary. Are you put here? Mm -hmm. Now, any of you knows that any profession has the, how they use their words. So if, if you are a nurse, they have a, I presume they have a nurse dictionary, a medical dictionary. Mm -hmm. So the, these Bible dictionaries are theological dictionaries so that you know how the word is used theologically, not in ordinary usage. Okay? Am I making sense? Okay. And these are some. Now, if you go to Google, 
I think it would be useful to you if the the definitions are coming from you. Can, I, I think some of these they should have them online. But I don't know if they will have it. Okay. But these are I'm giving you some of the best ones here. Number four, a topical Bible. Some of the Bibles they are your topical Bibles. I think Margaret must have one. So that you look at the Bible and just list up it. assurance, prayer, uh, spiritual warfare, or something <coughs> like that. Now, then I say here, I don't know, those of you who took preaching with uh, uh, Dr. Tabla, that personally, those, if some of you who have been in this church except for Estella, you will notice that when I start preaching, I stay on the passage I'm preaching from. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I stay on the passage. I very rarely preach topical sermons. Okay. For example, you get up and Estella, and you say, "I want to preach on uh, suffering." Okay. It's a topic. So what do you do? You look at the Bible and you look at different verses that illustrate that talk about suffering. So these Bibles will do that. Okay. But generally, what do I do? I do expository preaching. So I go to the scriptures, and I read the passage, and then I take my sermon from them. Now, can I look for other verses that I apply to? Yes. But all I'm doing is to explain the passage. And they call it expository preaching. Expository teaching. Now, some of you might... Most pastors live on topic of preaching. Today will be a, a marriage. A uh, 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 breakthrough. Okay, the biggest topic these days, eh? eh Stella, uh, how to receive your breakthrough? Eh? We, we, no, no, but, okay, but, but it's a topic. Uh, it's a topic of sermon. So all you do is you look at uh, Madeline. You look at scripture passages that deal with breakthrough. Okay. Now, these days. Some people specialize in topics. For instance, the Word of Faith, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Oral Roberts, Sea Faith. Faith. Uh, I don't know what is uh, this man uh, is very popular. Uh, T.D. Jakes. I don't know what he specializes in. I know. Um, what is the Perfect Gala specializes in grace too. Grace, okay. And Prince too also specializes in grace. You know? Okay. Bishop Johnson now, I think he's a specialist, as you will see tonight, of grace. Okay. That is not this topic. That's his thing. Okay? All right. Number five. A Bible handbook. It's a combination of an encyclopedia and a commentary. It's an excellent tool, so I put some of the excellent Bible. So we are still on the topical thing in the Bible. All right. Page four. Now, when I was in Liberia, I used to use this a lot, a keyword study. I had some books, all the criminals in Liberia, they took my books, okay? But I spent a lot of money. I didn't buy dresses for my wife when I first came to Bible school. I bought books, books on word studies, okay? One day I went into Lamentations chapter three and then duck up that thing. I preached in Liberia on, that, on the word. This of you, sometimes you heard me preach on the, uh, on the, it's compassion filled up. You knew it every morning. I dug lamentations and I did a word that, I mean, it's a powerful tool. The word Bible can speak to you if you really dig the etymology, the origin of that word and how it is used. Because look, the English language does not give you the true meaning of some of these words, like the Hebrew and the Greek does. So, a key word study will get, go deeper into the word. Thing like offering. Now, those of you who are here some Sundays ago, I preached on uh, Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your need according to the riches. You remember that where Paul said that the offering of the Philippians was, the giving of the, of the uh, Philippians was an offering to God. Right? Now the word offering, when they say let to offering in church, what do people think? Money. I know, but what do they think? It's just something I bring to God. Mm -mm. 
The word offering has a deeper meaning. It's almost like a libation that a group people used to do. You go, you go make farm, hmm? and the people before they make the farm, everybody, they will pour oil, thing like that, as an offering. Yeah, to the gods. Okay, because the I, the notion was, you are bringing this thing here to a deity. Offering is not something that you just drop one dollar in the plate. It's almost like offering yourself. It's part of you. Okay? So, key words that it will help you go deeper into the word. That's why, folks, it is essential sometimes not to rush to prepare a sermon or a teaching. It's not something that uh, I'm going to preach uh, on Sunday, Saturday night, and you just grab your Bible, and then you take the... the you know, and you take, you take, uh, you know, and then that's the time that you start depending on the uh, study Bible, what the people say, and you rush them because you have not done your homework. Now, what I'm sharing with you, people, it looks like it's too much hard work, right? No, it's good, though. Okay, okay. And then lastly, number seven, commentaries. Now, these are my, these are my least, I, I want you to consult them, but don't depend on them. Okay, there are several commentary. All a commentary does is it explain the passage for you. So if you are a lazy person, you just read a commentary. In a class, if I say, all right, I want you to do a study on John 3.16, you go and grab one of the uh, things. And I saw that because when I gave the uh, question about the book of Revelation, the author, I could see some people just go, went to Google, copy the whole thing because the language was not yours. Okay? Now, I could have given you a feeling great, but I didn't do that. Okay? But all people did was copy what somebody wrote. And that's what you can do when you go to a commentary. I'm not coming across as being uh, judgmental or something. Okay? But concordance or uh, commentary can make you fairly, fairly lazy. <laughs> all right, any question? So, we have not studied the Bible itself, or the methods, but these are the tools I thought I needed to deal with, and the presuppositions we wanted to cover, before we can even start teaching about the methods. Make sense? Okay, you tell me I did a good job now. Great job. Okay. Let me, you make me feel, feel good. Okay. <laughs> Talking about strong uh, concordance or uh, exhaustive. Uh, 